Different things to different people, a community, a living, moving organism, a collage of sights and sounds, asphalt, glass, steel and brick, but most important, people. And for a community to function effectively, there must exist a sharing and a persistent communication. Ideally, a community provides channels or agencies that are capable of caring for its members' welfare. Our community, because of increased population and complexity, found it hard to meet many of the daily needs of its members. Agencies were overwhelmed with trying to provide services to all segments of the community. Some people rejected the manner in which these services were offered. Other people were simply ignored. It became apparent alternatives were needed, alternatives which would be available to all members of the society. In 1969, Whitebird's socio-medical aid station was created to offer people a choice a choice that attempted to fill the medical and psychological needs we all experience. Our primary concern was with the care of the whole person, and we stated at the outset our goal would be met when there was no longer a need for our continued existence and services. Our initial focus was on the problem of drug abuse. My personal feelings on the subject of where I would take a person under the effects of drugs, I would probably take him to Whitebird or call Whitebird for the simple reason that it seems to cut out a lot of red tape. We don't have to decide who's going to pay the bill. Uh, and quite often the person that's using drugs is usually a person that's well, what you might call a street person or something of this nature. And he may feel a lot more comfortable at Whitebird. And the people there don't make him feel like he's some kind of a freak because perhaps his hair is long or he's got a long beard. Whereas if we took him to some of the other agencies, he might feel uncomfortable. And also, again, we'd have the red tape, and someone would have to pay the cost. started, effective treatment of drug abuse problems were controversial. We felt a drug abuse victim was not a criminal, but a casualty of our society. Most existing agencies lacked the manpower, the skills, and the desire to deal with this. We certainly are not trained to handle people on overdose of drugs, basically, other than saying, yes, there's something definitely wrong with that person, and if he stops breathing, we can give first aid and this type of thing. Effectively dealing with drug abuse demanded a close cooperation with the community's medical and law enforcement agencies. Such cooperation was difficult at first because of a mutual lack of trust. But over a period of time, there developed an atmosphere of respect and an exchange of skills. One good experience I had was a girl that took a large number of some type of pills and she was really far out. And the white bird, he sent three people over in the bummer squad, as they called it. And they took over right from us. They said, okay, gentlemen, you can leave. And they handled the situation. Peter? Peter, what did you take? Do you know? It's yellow. It's just yellow. It's a whole bunch of yellow. LSD? 
here. I want Steve. I want Steve. I don't want any more. Okay? Do you know when you took it, Peter? You're not going to take any more, Peter. It's all right. What time ago? Music stopped. I took yellows when the music stopped. Music stopped. Concert. Oh, the concert last night. Oh, it's about eight four hours, hours ago. Eight hours ago, anyway. One of the best things you can do for a, for a bummer is to convince him that he's not the only one that's completely crazy, and to show and not to single him out, because the more you treat him as if he's got some kind of terrible problem, the more he believes that. If things are going too fast, you just slow it down. And if there's too much coming in, then you cut down the stimulation, turn off the record player, turn down the lights. You have to be on top of yourself all the time because generally you're very empathetic with the bummer, or at least sympathetic. And you have to catch yourself from saying something that will feed into the system and keep them where they are. And it's hard to do. And after an hour or so of doing it, you just want to quit, get someone else to do it for a while. And sometimes it takes four or five hours. I don't like the trip. I don't like it. I don't want it anywhere. I wanted to go away. What well, would you like here? I want to go away. I don't want it to be here either. I'm scared. I don't believe you. If a hard drug is a bummer, it's usually life threatening kind of situation, an overdose of some kind. And then it's almost strictly a medical trip. You don't do any kind of counseling. You don't do any kind of physical reassurance, nothing. You keep them alive. Usually if it's barbiturates or heroin or something like that, people are in a depressed state. And a lot of times you have to be very rough and very loud just to keep them moving. You just do what it takes to keep them alive. I don't like it. I don't know anybody. I don't have any friends. Do you want to like it? Yeah, I know. I don't want to. I'm scared. It's okay. It's just Karen. Peter? Let's go talk to the police. You're police. I don't want you. Go away. The police have gone. Peter? This is Karen. One of the basic theories here is that you don't use one pill to counteract another pill. Part of it is that there's research now that shows that the major cause of LSD flashbacks is trips that have been truncated with Thorazine or whatever. Part of it is, is that this is much too much a drug-prone society anyway. And to believe that you can cure the effects of one drug with another drug is, is a dangerous assumption. When this clinic opened, there was almost no heroin problem in Eugene. You probably could have counted the number of people addicted to heroin on one hand. And now, Shine was estimating the other day that there are probably between <laughs> two and 500 addicts in this area. That's cool. <laughs> good. It's water. It's good stuff. It's water. That's water. Somebody gave you some acid. Yeah. Said it wasn't very good. Is it? <laughs> How are you feeling now? I feel pretty good. Would you like to go for a walk? Yeah, I want to go outside. Go for a walk with Karen and I? Yeah. Effectively dealing with a drug crisis by treating just the symptoms is only a temporary solution. The primary reasons for the crisis situation remain. Therefore, we wanted to reach individuals before drug abuse became their symptom. It takes people to reach people, and in addition to a small paid staff, skilled people with varied backgrounds began volunteering their services for both crisis help and ongoing counseling, medical treatment, community education, and training. Wiper Lenore. 
Hi. I don't know if you can help me or not, but I'm really pissed off, and I and I and I just don't know what to do. My, it's my parents. My my dad is just. He's just so bothering me. It's just I. I don't know what to do. He, they don't let me out of the house hardly. They don't trust me where I go. They don't trust my friends. Um, well, would I they allow you to come down here? Well, what could you do? Well, there's uh, someone here to talk to all the time, and we have counselors. And I'm sure they could help you. Yeah, I, I think I would like somebody to talk to. I do the desk because I think it's very important. Everything goes through the desk at the clinic. And I can't think of a more important job than getting people to where they need to go and seeing the right people. And there are people to answer almost any question that anyone has. And this is the important thing about the receptionist. She has to know where those people are and when they can see someone. Tina, why don't you come in tomorrow, say probably around four o'clock, and I'll see that uh, the counselor is here to see you and have Jerry set up an appointment for you. Is that okay? Yeah, I guess I could make it in by then. Well, that's fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Can I help you? Yeah, I'd like to see the doctor. Well, he'll be in in about uh, half an hour. Okay. You can sign up here. Okay. And what's the problem? I think I have a vaginal infection. Well, just put that down here, too. Okay. And if you're new or returned. Hi, Connie. My name's Karen. I need to get some general information for our files and Good. whatnot. Um, what's your last name? What is that? Um, are you on welfare? Mm-hmm. Um, what's your address? 55 West 3 days and, uh -huh. you know, it's Unlike most alternative clinics, Whitebird does not rely upon volunteer physicians. The medical section has a trained staff of paraprofessionals under the supervision of a paid medical doctor. Whitebird saw more than 13,000 people last year, and on the average, 500 people are seen monthly for primary health care treatment. One important aspect of Whitebird's medical section is its venereal disease clinic. The Lane County Public Health Department combines forces with Whitebird's medical staff and once a week conducts VD examinations at the clinic. The purpose of this unique relationship is to reach people who prefer the atmosphere of the clinic to that of the Public Health Department. In spite of the fact that hospitals are spending great sums of money for technological advances, there still exists the problem of primary health care delivery. Many people simply can't afford the exorbitant rates offered by established medical institutions. Okay. Well, what we'll do now is we'll do a pelvic exam on you, and we'll also okay. do a VD check as well. Whitebird Clinic maintains its own laboratory staffed by three competent technicians. The lab is able to do most routine tests and at a very minimal cost to the client. The most complex test is not over a dollar and a half. Close supervision of the medical clinic is maintained by its physician, Dr. Alan Cohn. Through Dr. Cohn's guidance, the medical section has grown and reached into areas of health care delivery normally not examined. Incorporating Dr. Cohn's philosophy with Whitebird's holistic approach to medicine has enabled the clinic to function on a very personal and in-depth level with the client. Connie, as you know, we took several lab tests on you, including a vaginal wet mount and a gram stain, and the results indicate that you have a yeast infection of your vagina, and this is what's causing the symptoms that you 
that you complained to us about. What is that? What is it? Well, yeast is an organism that lives normally in many places in the body, but for one reason or, or another, it uh, tends to overgrow under certain circumstances. Um, such circumstances include pregnancy or taking the birth control pill. Uh, one of the important aspects of, of our perspective here that makes white bird uh, very special in its relationship with the client is what we call the holistic approach. Um, this means that we, tr we make an attempt to look at the entire patient, the entire client, uh, and not separate out one uh, specialized aspect of this person. More often than not, uh, when a patient comes in complaining of a, of a certain uh, physical problem, there, is, uh, underlying, there are underlying reasons why the client is here. So we try to avoid making the mistake of just treating the, just treating the, the chief complaint uh, and make more of an attempt to find out the real reason why the client is here. The clients are um, oftentimes fooling themselves and by so doing fooling the physician as far as their real motives uh, for seeking help. Well, as far as a holistic approach is concerned, uh, I may be wrong, but uh, in this community, uh, we're the only ones that really have, have made, it, made a serious attempt to implement it. And the reason is because it's difficult and it's expensive and it's time consuming. Sacred Heart uh, has limited, limited funds, limited time, limited nurses that uh, they, it just is impossible for them. And of course public health is an extreme financial pinch with the, with the federal budget as it is now. And so actually we're the only place in the community at the present time that's been able to uh, implement a holistic approach. We've been lucky in that we've, we've made a lot of friends in the community, as well as making a few enemies, but the friends have spent a lot of time here helping us uh, uh, perform a service and have a successful program where we're, we're offering something to the client that's very difficult to find elsewhere. Connie, what we've just explained to you may seem confusing, and if it is, I highly recommend that uh, uh, you go to our women's clinic on Sundays. It's a, it's a place where uh, women get together and discuss problems that they have uh, which are inherent to women. They also do uh, treatment of vaginal problems such as the one you have right now. Um, I would think it's a better place to go at this time because I think it's a more efficient way of dealing with problems that are inherent to women. Um, I could introduce you to Chris Hansen and she's a nurse who works there and is responsible for a lot of things that go on there. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I'd really like to uh to do that. The yeast infection is an infection of the vagina and it's caused by a fungus. And um, normally there's a, there is a fungus in your, in your body, but um, because of whatever reasons, there may be an imbalance. And so the fungus grows and becomes a yeast infection. And some of the symptoms of a yeast infection, uh, which are in this book, by the way, BD Handbook, for some time now, the clinic has put considerable energy into prevention and education. An education in which we share experiences and help each other learn more about our minds and bodies. A federal grant enabled the formation of White Bird's Educational Annex to provide drug information and outreach services to many facets of the community. Based on the philosophy that prevention can eliminate the need for cure, the annex set out to dispel the traditional Band-Aid approach to medical care. One of the successful programs provided by the annex is the drug education class at the University of Oregon. Tony Burns, a graduate teaching assistant, has for several terms instructed the course. The class is designed for in-service teachers who are interested in alienated youth and problems manifested in drug abuse. Whitebird recently extended its outreach services in a unique program at the Oregon State Penitentiary. Twice weekly, clinic staff members have facilitated in counseling and rap sessions with ex-addicts who are in prison. In conjunction, a detoxification center for drug withdrawal was established. The detoxification center is staffed by ex-addicts, experienced counselors, and medical supervisors. Also working with the detoxification staff are several residents on work-study release from Oregon Correctional Institutions. Another 
important area of medical outreach has been White Bird's contribution of medical services at local functions, such as the March of Dimes Marathon Walk, outdoor fairs, and rock concerts. The service is the equivalent of a first aid station and has proven its usefulness many times. Always aware of the need for prevention and education, White Bird aided in organizing the Community Drug Education Task Force. The task force are concerned people who make up a cross-section of the community and act as a resource and forum for different perspectives concerning drug education. Another significant program is the Churchill High School Alternative Education Class. Joel Levitt, an experienced classroom facilitator, has been active in initiating the program and keeping it vital. I feel really confident working with with young people because they seem to have a need for the kind of uh, knowledge that I have and the kinds of skills that I can share with them. And I suppose I have a, a need to work with them too. So when you first went into prison, did you go to the or something? Oh yeah, they put you in it's terrible. It's not a way to withdraw from a drug. Like, what I would like to do is get like set up. So I see drug education as being uh, a vehicle for helping people to make better decisions about their drug-taking choices. Well, high school students will have to make those kinds of decisions because they're exposed to adults who drink and smoke. Not that that's good or bad, but that's happening. What is it in marijuana that gets you high? Oh, it's THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. And uh, I would talk about how it works on you, except that uh, I don't know, and I don't think anybody else does really satisfactorily, to talk about the, uh, the way it actually works on the body, what part it, it affects, and so forth. Does yeah. body build up tolerance to yeah. marijuana? Uh, smoke like you no, smoke. in fact, it might even be the other way around. There might be a negative tolerance. Role playing as a technique used in a learning situation can be really valuable because of people taking a look at situations from another person's point of view. In a role playing situation, you, you pretty much demystify the use of drugs if you're going to role play a drug using situation. I worked in a carnival and traveled around all over the country and uh, gave out soul percadine to the carnies because it was uh, really needed for that kind of life. And I got busted for that. What is it there? Oh, it's, uh... If I can get a student in touch with, uh, his mind and his body while he's in school and be aware of that, then I feel really good. We were trying to give a different approach to drug education. You know, we weren't, we weren't, uh, a health class, drug education class. We wanted to get into it more informally where we weren't focusing on drugs, but we were focusing on people, you know, people problems and, and what are people all about. You've got to take care of the people first of all, you know, the people problems, so that they don't have to bring in artificial things to pacify themselves. You know, that if they can get on just fine with each other and learn how to talk to each other, it'd be great if we could bring into the class um, administrators and parents and all kinds of people. Get the know. back straight. Yeah. We've been trying to get the facts straight. Since its inception, the lifeblood of the clinic has been the energy of its volunteers, and non-paid volunteers make up the vast majority of Whitebird's 400-plus working force. The going hasn't been easy. We've been accused of being an asylum for a drug-crazed counterculture and worse. But cooperation with local community agencies is increasing, and as our reputation and accountability grows, areas of outreach become more accessible to our staff. And we are always trying to improve ourselves and our services. Our messages are often heard through the media, and when we desperately needed financial help, the media worked for us, and the help was there. Our philosophy of preventative medicine, combined with the holistic approach, remain in the foreground of our healthcare system. We strive for better solutions through emphasis on self-help and not drug-induced resolutions. The clinic is open 24 hours a day to offer aid and comfort to anyone in need. Whitebird's goal will be met when there is no longer a need for our existence. But until that time, we will continue to do what we can to cure and prevent the diseases in our community. To do this, we must be able to reach the community.
the people. You've got to take care of the people first of all. You know, the people problem. And get the know. facts straight. Yeah. Fare thee well now, my good people.